you, Gilmore Church. Good morning uh, from our my home to yours. I'm so glad that you can join us this morning. Uh, we're coming to you live again this morning from many homes, and I'm, I'm just glad that we can do this together and make use of this technology. Um, I was reminded that in Paul's letter to the church in Colossae, he says, though I am absent from you in, in body, I am present with you in spirit. And we really want to approach our time together uh, this morning in the same way, knowing that though we're apart from each other, we can actually be together in spirit and be encouraged that, that in that, um, being encouraged that we are one family united under Christ, who is our head. Um, in mentioning that, I would encourage you to make use of the comment section below to let people know you're tuning in, you're watching, say hello. Uh, that way we can just encourage that connecting together. Um, I also encourage you to share this service with uh, family or friends, um, other people who you may know uh, their church might not be doing something like this. So it might be encouraging for them too. Um, but it's really neat that we can share it uh, with other people that way too. Um, a big thing these days seems to be the word connecting and staying connected. So we want to make sure that we're doing that with you also. Um, if you're not getting the email updates from Pastor Ben, that's a great way to start to be connected. His email is pastorben at gilmorechurch.ca. Uh, that's, that's a way to get onto the email list. You can also reach out to our connections pastor. Uh, that's Pastor Brenda, our connections pastor. Her email is brenda.man at gmail.com. And that's another great way to stay connected. Um, there was a recent update sent out from the finance committee and the deacons um, about uh, a financial update. So that's important for you to know. Check out your emails for that. Uh, it includes a, a detailed list of ways that you can give. Um, there are some updates to that, such as there's an e-transfer option now, which might make it easier for some of you. Um, of course, you can still go to the church between 11 and 12 this morning to uh, drop off your, your tithes that way. And uh, we just, we're so grateful for God's provision for us. Thank you for those that have continued to give faithful, faithfully. Um, know that you'll be blessed because of that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in God's word, we are invited to come and to worship. And this morning's call to worship is from Psalm 92 verses one and two. I'll read that. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness, faithfulness by night. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we are so glad to be in your presence this morning. Lord, we are excited about this Time to gather together, uh, to be encouraged by your word, to sing to you. Uh, Lord, we, we lay everything at your feet, every distraction, everything that could pull us away from you. We give it to you this morning and we declare that we want more of you, Jesus. Lord, we want to know you. We want to experience your power and your presence so thank you for meeting us here in this time. Lord, we come to you uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. We ask that everything we, we do and say, uh, that the meditations of our hearts would bring you glory and honor this morning. God, I pray for Pastor Ben as he brings uh, your word to us this morning. I ask that you would give him uh, your strength, that you would give him your words. Lord, we long to hear from you this morning. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we pray all of these things. Amen. I'm going to pass things off to Christy Lynn. She's leading us in music this morning. Thanks, Christy Lynn. Good morning. It's a pleasure to worship with you this morning. Um, I do ask that you pardon the old squeaky piano that is slightly out of tune as well. Um, but uh, I hope and pray that this morning your focus would just be on truly and earnestly worshiping the Lord uh, because he is worthy of worship. Uh, let's worship and sing together.
Christ alone. We praise you for your sovereignty, for your goodness, and for your mercy. Thank you. Amen. Let's sing Awesome God together. And this will be a repeat prayer, so you repeat after me. Dear God, thank you. Good morning, boys and girls. It's Pastor Brenda. And I wanted to read you a story from the book of Matthew. It's from chapter 6, and it says, Look at the birds flying around. They do not plant seeds, gather a harvest, and put it in barns. Your Father in Heaven takes care of them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? And why worry about clothes? Look how the wildflowers grow. They do not work or make clothes for themselves. But I tell you that even Solomon, as rich as he was, had clothes as beautiful as one of these flowers. It is God who clothes the wild grass grass that is here today and gone tomorrow. Will he not all the more clothe you? Well, these little violets are so pretty and it reminds us of what God has made and they're beautiful. And I am so thankful that God made the birds and the flowers, but I'm really thankful that he made us and he wants to be with us and to help us. Now, sometimes when we have things not going so well for us, we might wonder, does God really know what's going on? And do you think God knows about COVID-19? Well, the answer is yes, even when things are hard, when it's kind of like we have rocks in our lives, God still knows and cares and looks after us. Now, a funny thing, where these flowers are in my flower bed, just close by, there are some more growing, but they are growing out of the rocks. They're growing where it's hard soil, where things are not so good. And just like God looks after the birds that are flying around and you can hear chirping, he also looks after the flowers, even when they are having a hard time, like when they are stuck in these rocks. And so we are thankful to God that he loves us, that he made us, and that he cares for us. And this will be a repeat prayer, so you repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for making the flowers and making the animals and the birds and for making me. Thank you that you love me so much and that you are with me all the time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, boys and girls. It was nice to have you pray with me. Bye for now. Good morning. 
Thank you uh, for the time with the children. And now we're going to uh, come to God in prayer. Before I start, I just wanted to tell you that I've recently been reading a book called When the Church Was a Family. And it's recapturing Jesus' vision for authentic Christian community. So the whole idea of family has really been on my mind. And this morning, as we uh, come together in prayer, I'm going to use, use the word family as my framework. And so uh, please join me as we pray together. Father God, if we come to you as your people, as your family, we thank you that whether we have been a part of your family for a short time or for a very long time, that you welcome us and that you bring us together as your family. We thank you for our Gilmore family, for those who are newer to our family, those who have been there for a few years or many years. And we include those who are watching today, who maybe don't have another church family to be a part of. We thank you, Father, that through this medium, we can connect with all and that you welcome all, whether we attend a particular place to worship or whether we can only meet together now because of the means of this communication. I thank you for faith, for the faith of the generations past here at Gilmore, but more importantly, for the faith that now we as your people can share with others, with our neighbors, with our friends, with our children, with our grandchildren. We thank you that we can rely on our faith in you. And we remember our friends, our church family is friends. Those who are outside that relationship that are also friends that we know need you. And so we bring before you now our family, our faith, and our friends. We thank you, Father, that you are always with us, that you are all knowing, that you're all caring that you know everything that is going on. We thank you that we can depend on that. We thank you for answering our prayers. Father, in this world, when they, we are faced with so many challenges, knowing that we can come to you in prayer and that you will answer in the best way, that is what really encourages us on. For M, we think of managing our relationships. In this time of weeks of being more locked down away from our workplace, our extended families and friends, and being sort of held together in one place, the stress can be uh, different and more developed than some other times. And so we pray for our relationships and would you help us to manage them in a way that we are cautious with our words and our tone that we share loving thoughts and that we encourage each other and we especially pray for marriages father would you come and place your your hand on ours as we work together through our marriages and we thank you for the strength that we can have when a marriage is good. And we thank you, Father, for those marriages who are struggling in that we know you are the one that can bring them back together. We remember those, Father, today who are facing illnesses, those who are recovering from surgeries. We remember Lynn and Linda as they have finished some surgeries and are preparing for treatment. We pray for those who are ill because of COVID. We remember those we may know who have the virus, those who we don't know but are aware of in our communities. And we do pray for an end of this virus, Father. And as we think of illnesses, we also 
think of those who are grieving their losses. Some that have been recent or maybe from times, weeks or months past, and some that are grieving the knowing that their loved ones are getting closer to leaving this world. Father, would you comfort and guide each of those hearts? We pray for those who are lonely today, especially our seniors who may be living on their own or young people, people away from other family members. Please help us in our loneliness to turn to you, the only one who can truly understand everything, even without us saying it out loud. So would you be with those who are anxious or worried, be with those who are in need, and Father, would you give us the uh, understanding and the abilities to reach out and help meet those needs through your love. And Father, for why we remember that and we realize that we are yearning to be closer to you. We yearn, Father, to know you better, to understand what you have for us in our lives and our futures. We yearn to understand your scriptures better. And as Pastor Ben leads us this morning in Ephesians, would you open our ears and our minds and our hearts as we learn more about you? And now, Father, we pray together as your family, repeating the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Brenda. I'll be reading from Ephesians 5.21 to 6, verse 9. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the church does, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke to anger your children, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, and with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, 
knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Father, thank you for your word. Now to Pastor Ben. Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, thank you, Brenda, for leading in our prayer today. And for uh, Christy Lynn for leading us in worship. For Brent, for op opening up our service this morning. Uh, many of you won't know that Jonathan is uh, behind the scenes helping us uh, greatly in the technological aspect of things. So, Jonathan, thank you as well. Uh, it's, it is uh, wonderful that we can um, connect as we are. And um, it's not, not as good as in person, but uh, this, is, this is still pretty amazing. So we're, we're grateful to God. Um, you know, having said that, I, I wonder if some of you are struggling today and uh, struggling with the fallout of the pandemic. And I uh, just want to say as I begin today that if, if you are, uh, you're not alone. Um, I'm trying to practice what I preached last week. And that is staying connected to Christ, staying in the true vine uh, day by day, hour by hour. And, um, yeah, you know, some moments are better than others. And, uh, and I just want you to know that if you're feeling frustrated or if you're feeling kind of worn out and, and tired of all this, I am right with you. And <laughs> I certainly am praying, you know, for, um, for an end to this as, as you are. So let's keep, uh, let's stick to keep sticking together. And, um, uh, and more than that, staying connected to Christ and in and through this day by day. I want you to know that our worship committee has been meeting and will be meeting again soon uh, to discuss the drive in church worship uh, option. As we know, the preference is now allowing for us. So uh, stay tuned for more information on that. And uh, we'll look forward to. Uh, seeing what we can do together as the, uh, as the weeks unfold before us. Let's, uh, let's bow our hearts together and, and pray. Uh, so, Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you, God, that, uh, uh, that you are with us right now. Uh, Lord, that we can be together in spirit. Lord, thank you for the, uh, the, the relationships that, that we have and that we can continue to foster in, in different ways during this season of pandemic. Help us, Lord. Help us now, Lord, to have open hearts to your word and uh, to receive uh, these timeless principles, uh, to write them on our hearts and apply them day by day. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think it's really neat, Brenda, that you uh, led us in a prayer on family today, and because we're going back to Ephesians, and uh, and this section of text that Chris read for us this morning has to do with God's blueprint for the Christian family and for the Christian home, and uh, really as we apply it to today for the Christian society. But uh, that's the title of my message: here, God's blueprint for the Christian home, and we're looking at the third section that Paul talked about in this respect. Now, it's been a couple of months since we've been in Ephesians, so if, if you aren't already there, open your Bible there to Ephesians chapter 6. March 8th was my last sermon in this series, and I'd hoped we'd be back together at Gilmore by now, and I could pick up uh, in this series, but because we're not sure about this timeline, um, I don't want to wait any longer. I want to finish Ephesians with you, and so we're going to be looking at uh, our last chapter in the next few weeks. And I'm going to pick up where I left off. Now, um, Chris read for us the passage, and I want to just refresh us on, uh, on, on the subject matter here. As you might recall, Paul's writing to the Christian church in the city of Ephesus, and this was a letter that would have gone to the Ephesian Christians, modern-day Turkey. A, you can still see the ancient ruins there. And it would have been circulated around Asia Minor. Um, he's writing from prison. We know from chapter 3, verse 1. And he's, he's in Rome. He's, he's under house arrest. He probably has a Roman soldier uh, chained to his arm there. And, um, and in the first half of the book, because there's six chapters, so in the first three uh, chapters, Paul writes about the message of the gospel. 
He writes about our new identity in Christ. And the first half of Ephesians, you might remember, is uh, very theological, very doctrinal. The second half of the book uh, is more practical. It's the more practical side of our faith as Paul teaches the church what it is to live out our new identity in Christ as a community of believers, as a family of God. Uh, We might say that the first half of Ephesians teaches us about who we are in Christ, and the second half of Ephesians is the instruction about becoming who we are, living out what Jesus has made us to be. So in chapter 5, we we come to this second-to-last teaching unit in the book, and it has to do with relationships. And the overarching message in this second to last section is found in 521, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What, what we're taught in God's word here is that we're to honor Jesus through mutual submission. Now, first he addresses the, the marriage relationship, which we talked about, which I preached on in late February and then, then he talks about uh, the relationship between parents and children. And then thirdly, the text we're going to look at today is the relationship between slaves and masters. So we're going to pick up here in chapter 6, verse 5. Paul is addressing slaves, sometimes translated bond servants. I'm going to use that word interchangeably, and, uh, and that will depend on your translation, what you see on your page there. But So Paul picks up, uh, we're going to pick up where Paul writes here in in verse 5 of chapter 6, where he says, God's word says to us today, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. So it begins with that word bond servants, or your translation might even say slaves. Now, it's, uh, it's, not surprising that the church in Ephesus uh, would would have slaves mixed in together with masters. So this this, this unit is is to slaves and masters, and 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 that's not surprising because historians estimate that in the New Testament times, about a third of the Roman population were slaves. Up to sixty million people in that Roman Empire would have had that uh, title in their lives of of being a slave or having once been a slave. Uh, Some of the congregation in Ephesus would have been slaves. Some of them would have been freed slaves or former slaves. And some would have been the masters of slaves. So uh, that word slave, right, when we we think of it, or at least when I do, often get these images of of the southern United States. I think of uh, plantations and... uh, cruel plantation owners. But, you know, we need to put aside that idea and that initial thought in our minds, because in the New Testament times, slavery was different. Uh, you know, so, so don't, don't, think of, uh, don't think of the Deep South uh, and uh, the slave situation there when we read it in the Bible. See, when Paul's writing this letter by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the average slave was not subject to extreme exploitation. It's true that slaves could have been bought and sold, and were bought and sold, rather. It's true that some suffered at the hands of their employers or their masters. But it's also true, at the time of this writing, that the Romans had changed changed laws with regards to slaves. And slaves could uh, generally count on being set free, and some, actually many, up to half, were set free by the age of 30. So slaves could also own property. Slaves could purchase their freedom. Uh, They often lived in separate homes than their masters and could hold various positions. You know, some slaves in the ancient world would have been cleaners. uh, Some would have been in sales. Some even ran businesses for their masters. So um, uh, some even, actually, this I found interesting in my study this week, some even sold themselves into slavery in order to build connections in society and to gain Roman citizenship. For some, being a slave was better off than not being a slave. Uh, So, you know, we need to remember, as we read the Bible, we need to try and do our best to understand the original timeline, the original context in which it was given. Uh, It helps us give a a better understanding of what the message was to the people of the time and helps us better apply it to our lives today. 
Now, some might ask, well, why doesn't the Bible directly attack slavery? Uh, and, and that's a fair question. And uh, the answer is because slavery back then, as I've just explained, isn't like the African and American uh, slavery practiced much, much later. Uh, also because there were changes in Roman law concerning the welfare of slaves. Also because it was not considered evil by slaves and masters. And finally, uh, because the radical message of the gospel and loving one another, that is, is, ends up being the, the death sentence for slavery itself. So what are the parallels to our society today? Where does this teaching about slaves and masters uh, relate to us 2,000 years later? And the connection today is best seen as we compare the relationship between first century slaves and masters to 21st century, century employees and employers, bosses and workers. So I, that's how I, I think we need to look at this today. And that's how scholars today um, uh, would agree. Uh, this really is applied best as we consider uh, in our modern day roles of employee, employer, boss, and, and worker. So I'm going to look at the parallels here. I'm going to try and parallel that, uh, that teaching that we find here to that, that uh, situation we're in today. So there's just five verses for us today. And verses 5 to 8 are directed toward the slave and verse 9 to the master. So we're going to look at the slave first and what uh, God's word has to say about those in that uh, those in the ancient world in that in that position and today's position of being an employee or a worker. What does the Bible teach us about the obedience of first century bond servants or slaves? What does it look like? Well, let's start at verse five, a eh? beginning of uh, verse five. Bond servants obey. Bond servants obey your earthly masters um, with fear, Paul adds, and trembling. So first of all, the obedience is, is a th key theme here. Uh, and it's an obedience that's to be marked with respect. So as a Christian living in the first century and living under the rule of a master, Paul writes, obey with fear and trembling. Now, many slaves became Christians in the ancient world. And the message was clear. Don't run away in search for some kind of freedom. You might find yourself in jail. Rather, rather, Christian and slave here, be obedient. Be obedient. So it's, it's a, there's a call here to obey and to honor God. Um, but, but do so in a way that has, you, you, you give a faithful testimony uh, to those who you work for. Regardless of their character, these, the, the employee, uh, the slave in the ancient world that's become a believer in Jesus Christ is to obey. Now, as Christian workers, we need to uh, be an example. We need to be an example in our work ethic. We need to be an example in our productivity. We need to be an example in our willingness. And this will help others become more inclined to hear the message of the gospel that we have to share with them. You know, when, a, when an employment situation is intolerable, it may be time to move on. But as long as one is employed, we should work to the best of our ability. You know, just, just imagine if, if Paul had wrote to the slaves at the church of Ephesus, okay, uh, now that you're Christians, you don't have to obey your master anymore, and you can just, just take off. Now, now, that would have been a subversive message to the whole ec economy of the time. The message that Paul gave to the slaves in the church was to obey and to honor. To We're going to see, work faithfully, work hard. Um, Paul says our, our obedience should be marked with fear and trembling. The idea here is not that gr the Christian slave or employee should uh, shake in their boots when their master comes around, but rather... The slave or the employee in our context should honor and, and uh, be quick to please. Uh, there should be no place in the Christian life, in the Christian worker, uh, for subtle insubordination, disrespect, and disobedience. This should not mark our lives. This should not mark our witness in the community. The next thing in verse 5 is that there were to obey, or slaves were to obey with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. To obey as we would Christ. 
So we need to have the right kind of attitude in our reverence. And we also need the right kind of commitment in being sincere. So Paul writes that we should conduct ourselves with genuine commitment and not be, not be superficial and not be hypocritical. Now, verse 5 ends with these words, as you would Christ, as you would Christ. The focus and the vision of a sincere worker is Jesus Christ. What primarily motivates us to work is to be Jesus. Now think about your own life for a minute. What, what's your primary motivation to work, to get up every day and go to work? Now, if you're retired, I guess you can, you can hit pause for a minute or something. Or, but seriously, though, like, what's your motivation to go to work? What's your motivation? Is, is it money? Is it the love of the job? You know, it could be one of those things. Paul's calling for employees. I think we can really accurately, trans, you know, parallel this to the life of an employee today. Paul's calling us to look to Jesus as our motivation. As you would Christ, Paul says. Obey, uh, honor, um, as you would Christ. Now, uh, Kent Hughes put it, puts it this way, that we are serving Christ as we serve those over us is to be the transforming realization and motivation behind our work. It's to be the transforming realization and motivation that we're serving Christ as we serve those over us. Now, reminds me of this, uh, this reminds me of 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which says, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So no matter what we're doing, no matter who we're working for, we've got to be thinking of God, thinking of, of His glory, thinking of the honor of, of His name. Often we're thinking of ourselves. We're thinking of the horizontal. But to have that vertical perspective, even in our work, boy, that's, uh, that's transformational. As one pastor and uh, uh, put it, you know, wh- whether, we're, um, whether we're working in our home, uh, whether we're cleaning in our yard, right? Whether we're, uh, whether we're working in the community, no matter what we're doing, we can, we can do all these things with Jesus in mind and his glory in mind. Uh, let's look at verse six. Paul writes, not by way of eye service, are we to obey and work and honor our employers? But as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. So not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. I like how the, the New Living Translation um, uh, put it, uh, verse 7 and 8, uh, this way. Uh, work with enthusiasm, Paul goes on to say, as though you were working f- for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. It's always nice to kind of have a couple of different translations with you as you're, uh, as you're studying and looking at this. But <clears throat> uh, getting back to verse 6, uh, not by way of eye services, people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. I'll never uh, forget uh, spending a year working in a fiberglass factory in Ajax. And most of the employees there were not Christians. Um, and some were consistently hardworking. But there were others that seemed to find a whole new gear whenever the boss showed up. And it was an owner-operated business. So uh, the, the boss was often on the floor. And I think he did that on purpose because he knew when he was around, he got a whole other gear out of his employees for the work that they did. But we need to remember to work conscientiously. And I think that's what verse 6 is telling us here. We need to work conscientiously. Like, even if the job's not exhilarating, we're called to do our best all the time. And not just when the boss is around, right? Not just when he's, he or she is looking. So we're to, we're to, work, we're to work obediently. We're to work respectfully, honoring. Uh, We're to work sincerely. We're to work ultimately for Jesus. We're to work conscientiously. Notice notice there's so much. There's so many many important uh, messages here 
uh, for the employee. Uh, and finally, we're to work enthusiastically. Uh, work with enthusiasm, verse 7. Render service with goodwill, as, as it's put in the ESV, as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. Now, our Christ, as Christian employees, as a Christian employee, are you a cheerful person to work with? Are you pleasant to work with? Right? Now, if I ask you the question, have you ever worked with a, a whiner? Someone who calls himself a Christian but just whines all the time. Have you ever worked with a Christian who's really a sourpuss to be around at work? Like, I imagine you have. Uh, I've been there. And that's not fun. That's not cool for anyone to be around. So I think this is really, really a, uh, a practical message for us, that we are to work with a cheerful heart. We are to work with a goodwill attitude, to work enthusiastically as we work for Christ. Uh, and notice what Paul writes here. We will receive back from the Lord. We will receive back from the Lord. Now, there's a heavenly reward for following God's word. Whether that be for the first century slave or the 21st century employee, this is a message we're to hold close to our heart. And should it really, it should put a smile on our face. So the world is watching. The world is watching you and I as followers of Jesus. Uh, we need to remain in him. We need to stay connected to Christ. Uh, and by his enabling spirit, we can become the kind of uh, employees that he would want us to be in our world today. And now masters, they're not off the hook, right? Notice this, the apostle has a word for masters, or we might, we might call the employers of today. And look at verse 9. The scripture says, Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there's no partiality with him. Well, so this is what we could call the manager's golden, golden rule, right? Um, what, what is God's word telling the masters and the owners and the business owners in our context? And what this verse is saying is treat your slaves, treat your employees the way you want to be treated. Do you want respect? Show respect. Do you want sincerity? Show sincerity. Do you want a conscious, conscientious employee rather an, or an enthusiastic employee? Model it in yourself. You know, the first work of the Christian employee and the Christian employer is to do the will of God and to model Christ likeness. Now, here Paul also writes, right, stop your threatening, he says in verse 9. Stop your threatening. Now, the idea here is that uh, that of loosening or releasing. And I believe the message here is that bosses must guard against throwing their weight around or being harsh or being a bully. No one likes to uh, work for a boss that's like that. The next phrase here in verse 9 to the masters is that reminder. He says, uh, he who is both, he says, knowing that, knowing that he who is both their master and is yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So here Paul's reminding the, the masters in the ancient home right, in uh, the homes of the ancient world. And he's reminding bosses of today, Christian bosses of today, remember that Jesus is both your master and their master. Remember Almighty God. Remember he's over both of you. As a Christian employer, you're not more important or more worthy than your employee. And that's because, as the scripture says here, with God, there is no partiality. With God, there's no partiality. Dear congregation, when these are lived out, when as Christian employees and as Christian employers, we follow God's instruction and God's blueprint, the message to the world is both radical and it's redemptive. We're a family of disciples. We are a community of Christ followers. And when we follow his word, people will see we're different. People will see we're different. People will see the transforming power of Jesus working through us day by day 
as we work, as we lead. So even now through this pandemic, many of us are, are working. Some of you are business owners yourselves. And this pandemic has probably thrown a wrench in some of the relationships in your working environment, whether as an employee or as an employer. You know, what doesn't change is God's timeless word, God's timeless truths. Let's remember, let's remember to apply them to our lives, that we would be people that, that work as God wants us to work, that we would work with honor, honoring, our, honoring those who are uh, our employers, that we would work sincerely, that we would, that we would work conscientiously, that we would work even enthusiastically, uh, that as business owners, uh, that we would model Christ to those that we employ, and that people would seek Jesus in all that we do. May that be our, our prayer. So many of us are working, many of us are leading. How is God's word speaking to you and to your situation right now? I don't doubt, I don't doubt that, that God's word can be applied even now into your situation. Uh, will you have that open heart to say, okay, Lord, <laughs> help me to be the kind of employee you want me to be. Help me to be the kind of employer you want me to be. And if there's areas in your life and in your witness that you know haven't matched up according to God's word and what we found today, give that over to the Lord. Just repent of that. Say, God, I, you know, I've, I haven't been the kind of employee that you want me to be, or I haven't been the kind of boss that, that really models Christ in everything. So Lord, help me. I believe God will. Lean on him for the grace to be who God wants you to be. Let's pray. So Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we have an opportunity as workers or as bosses to, to really send a message to our community uh, of how transformational the gospel is in our lives day by day by day. Uh, Lord, we need your help. Um, perhaps there are some listening in here that have a really rough relationship with their boss. Or perhaps there's, a, there's an employer listening in here that has got a really tough situation with an employee. And so, Lord, I pray that you will, that you will give them grace, that, Lord, you will help them to know uh, what to apply to their, to their situations from your word. Uh, Lord, help us to be who you want us to be. Help us to model in our work and in our leading Christ-like attitudes, uh, a humble uh, submission, a willing obedience, and a strong work, work ethic. Help us to, to be an example to those around us, to be an example to our children, to be an example to our community. Uh, Father, um, we need you for all this and we thank you that you live in us by your spirit and you enable us to be the people you call us to be in jesus name amen amen let's uh let's close in a song and we'll turn it over to christy lynn
Thank you, Christy Lynn, and uh, that beautiful hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee. May that be uh, a song that resonates in our hearts today, as we love God by following His Word, and as we love God by uh, doing our utmost as employees or as employers uh, for His highest. I want to read to you a word of benediction from the book of Numbers, and it's, uh, it's called The Ironic Blessing, and you've probably heard it before. It reads this way, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen to that. I pray that uh, that word will bless you today. And uh, just a reminder for our kids, if, if you got a chance to do the coloring page that I sent out by email, uh, fill in that coloring plate, do, do that great work. And, uh, Consider sending it to someone. Uh, consider bringing it. Uh, we're going to paint the. We're going to color this up. The kids are going to color this up. And we're going to bring it to uh, Una Golding this week as uh, as a little token of, of love for her. And uh, I hope you can, um, yeah, just continue to share the love of Christ to those uh, that you can these days. Keep looking out for each other. Keep loving. Uh, keep calling. Um, and uh, may God's uh, may God's love be found pouring into your heart and pouring through you. God bless you today. Uh, continue to live in his grace. Bye for now.